So I'm Andrew Vickers and I'm a biostatistician at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. You've been studying the outcomes of radical prostatectomies, the skills of individual surgeons, and how their skill levels affect outcomes. Tell us a little about this. I guess we assume that surgery is a, pro is a treatment for prostate cancer, and then so whoever surgeon you'll, you'll see, you'll get surgery and you'll have a sort of equivalent results. But when you think about it a little bit more carefully, it seems reasonable to suppose that different surgeons might well have different results uh, because of differences in skill levels. And there's two different ways of looking at the, the issue of skill levels. Uh, there may be uh, an issue of inherent skill. One surgeon is just sort of better uh, at surgery than another, just as, you know, ha no matter how much basketball I play, I'm never going to play like Michael Jordan. I mean, it's just, it's just never going to happen. Um, but then there's also the issue of experience, a measurable difference. Uh, it's something we can measure that we can say there are differences between uh, surgeons. And certainly, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as an English statistician who's never played basketball. If I, if I practiced, I, I would probably get better. So we've actually been looking at some very large international data sets, looking at the outcomes of radical prostatectomy, looking at whether there are differences between surgeons, both in ways that we can measure and in, in things that we, we in fact can't measure. Um, and our most well-known studies are what's called the learning curve. Um, and so what we've, we do is we, we look at surgeons' entire case histories and we look at their cure rates uh, right at the beginning and then after they've treated 10 patients, 100 patients, 250 patients, and so on and so forth. And what we found is very dramatic re uh, reductions in cancer occurrences uh, as surgeons move up a learning curve. Um, and so the, the, the headline figure that's, that we often use is that for an inexperienced surgeon, a surgeon who's done maybe 10 prior radical prostatectomies, for a typical patient, their recurrence rate at uh, five years is about 18%. Um, now, a more experienced surgeon with 250 cases, that goes down to 11 or 12%. Now, that's a very, very, very large difference. It's, it's far more than we'd expect for, uh, for any drug. Uh, and perhaps even more dramatic, if you look at just organ confined disease, which is really in most, most US men do present with organ confined disease, the recurrence rates for an inexperienced surgeon are 10 to 15 percent. For the most experienced surgeons, those who've done 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 cases, the recurrence rates are actually less than 1 percent. A tenfold difference in recurrence rates by surgeon experience uh, that leads us to the conclusion that recurrence in organ confined disease is predominantly a matter of surgical technique. Does the specific type of surgery being performed, open surgery, robot-assisted surgery, etc., seem to make any difference to the general principles you describe? We've actually separately looked at the learning curve for laparoscopic surgery. So that's not, not robotically assisted, pure laparoscopic surgery. And we actually found very, very similar results. It was a, a nice independent replication of our findings. The, the, the laparoscopic surgeons started with pretty much exactly the same recurrence rate as the open surgeons, right when they, they were doing their first surgery. And by the time they'd gone up to a thousand surgeries, they, their recurrence rates were pretty much exactly the same as the open surgeons. But their learning curve was slower. It took longer for them uh, to get there. And I, I guess this makes some kind of sense, is that you know, if you speak to a laparoscopic surgeon, they'll say, yeah, it's more difficult to learn. 250 radical prostatectomies to, to really be good at this uh, procedure. Um, we wanted to know, well, you know, what, what proportion of, of surgeons have actually reached that plateau? And um, so we did this study where we looked at the number of surgeries that were typically being done by U.S. urologists. And, you know, we obviously restricted our sample to, to those who were doing at least one radical prostatectomy a year. And we found out it wasn't a question of, you know, how many, pay, how many surgeons were at the learning curve or how long it was taking them to get there. It was, I mean, mo most surgeons, they had no chance of ever getting up the learning curve in their entire surgical careers. The most common number of radical prostatectomies per year amongst U.S. urologists who did a radical prostatectomy was one. The median was three. Eighty percent of surgeons were doing ten or fewer. Uh, there were really very, very few surgeons that were, were doing the sort of high volume surgery that's going to lead them to develop the experience to give the best possible care to patients. And I think, I think that really it behooves the profession to look very critically at the way they're organizing highly specialist cancer care, such as a radical prostatectomy, so that uh, maybe we're shifting from 
uh, a, a lot of surgeons doing a little surgery to perhaps fewer surgeons doing a lot of surgery. Is this making a difference in the way your colleagues are starting to teach the next generation of surgeons? Are you able to use this information in practical ways to improve surgical skills and outcomes? You know, clearly, the, the, the fact that we're having these massive differences in recurrence rates has a lot of implications for clinical practice, how we organize surgery in the U.S., um, research. I mean, we spend billions every year looking at the cancer cell under the, the microscope, or whether it's a, a light microscope or the chemical microscope, so to speak. Uh, we, we're not spending anything on looking at the surgeon's scalpel under the microscope. Uh, we actually had a commentary, very nice commentary uh, uh, editorial on one of our papers. Um, uh, somebody at Michigan was saying, you know, every University of Michigan linebacker is videoed repeatedly to make sure that they're, you know, in the three-point stance and they're getting off the stance and moving to the left. Surgeons, go away and do your thing. I, I mean, but even if we do, you know, were to video surgeons, we're not quite sure how we would actually even analyze those uh, videos. Um, and so there's, uh, and then there's, there's education. How should we be teaching surgeons to do good surgery? Right now, you're board certified and that's it. I mean, you have to come to meetings like this and listen to people like me talk about the latest research. I'm not really sure that's actually gonna improve your surgical results. So an issue of should there be continuing practical medical education for surgeons? In the last few years, there has been an increasing focus on attempts to develop and implement better studies related to outcomes. Are you seeing an improvement in the quality of those types of study? My, my sort of little group at, at MSK, I'm in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, which has been there since the year dot. Uh, my sort of subdivision within that is called the Health Outcomes Research Group, and it didn't exist a few years ago. A lot of this new ideas about the way that we should look at, at medicine is relatively recent. And, and I guess you can break it down, research, in, into three general categories. We can do research looking for new cures. So that's the typical thing where you're looking at cancer cells and what is causing metas metastasis and could we get a, a drug to block that and you could spend money on um, seeing whether those new cures work so that would be clinical trials it, it's a very recent idea that we should be spending money on making sure that the established and proven cures are actually getting to the patients that need them in the right way so whether that's people looking at and showing that a lot of people uh, with colon cancer aren't getting chemotherapy when they should or uh, we actually did a study showing that many women who really stand to benefit from tamoxifen aren't getting it even when they're told it would benefit them we have no idea why that is uh, or in prostate cancer we know that a radical prostatectomy saves lives and now we're saying well how much is you know the, the chance it's going to save your life actually depends critically on the surgeon that you see has there been any reaction from the American Urological Association regarding this research? Uh, you, you hear these little rumblings. I know that some of our, I mean, we're, we're here at the you know, annual conference at the AUA, and there was a big board meeting of the AUA uh, looking at, at training, and they've actually used some of our data to look at the way that we should be doing training. Uh, um, we, we've looked at our data in all sorts of ways, and, and one of the interesting things that, that, that I've heard the AUA are interested in is that fellowship training, uh, fellowship trained surgeons have a good learning curve. Those without fellowship training, they just never got better over time. There's something about fellowship training that confers upon the surgeon the ability to learn from his or her mistakes and to get better over time.